How patriotic are you? Would you sacrifice your own life for the sake of your country? Well, these Japanese pilots might do it. Kamikaze pilots were part of the suicide bombing tactics that were designed to destroy enemy warships during World War II. The pilots would crash directly into Allied ships, and these kamikaze pilots would also die in the process. But what exactly was the life of a kamikaze pilot like? That's exactly what we discuss in this video today. Welcome back to Binge History, a place where you can binge history like you binge eat. Make sure to subscribe to our channel for more content just like this one and turn on post notifications. With all that done, let's head back to World War II. The Kamikaze suicide bombers were a part of a strategy launched in 1944 towards the end of World War II. It involved about 3,800 Japanese fighter pilots killed and more than 7,000 casualties, including Americans, Australian and British soldiers. This brutal idea was conceived by Vice Admiral Takijiro Onishi, the commander of Japan's naval air force in the Philippines when US troops landed on late. In fact, at the time, Japan was on the brink of losing the war. They had lost several important battles, many of their best pilots had been killed, their aircraft were becoming outdated, and they had lost command of the air. On October 25, 1944, the Emperor of Japan, Hirohito, decided to order kamikaze bombers for the very first time. His tactic was a part of the ferocious Battle of Late Gulf, which is the largest naval battle in history that took place in the Pacific Ocean near the Philippines. The kamikaze pilots deliberately crashed into enemy warships, and this continued afterwards throughout World War II. However, even with these desperate tactics, Japan lost the Battle of Late Gulf. At the end, Japan was forced to accept an unconditional surrender less than a year later. The Japanese word kamikaze translates to divine wind. It refers to the storms that saved Japan from the invading Mongol fleets under Kublai Khan in 1274. Since Japan was struggling towards the end of World War II, giving a name with a symbolic meaning like this was to hope that they would win the war at the end. Speaking of the culture, this self-induced spirit of self-sacrifice has always been associated with the samurai. Traditionally, samurai would rather die than dishonor their master. Since loyalty takes up a big part of such spirit, showing voluntary faithfulness to the country and loved ones is highly valued. Therefore, almost everyone appointed as kamikaze pilots would choose to do so because refusing would bring a lot of shame to their families. These pilots were also invited to meet the Emperor of Japan, which was considered huge back in the day. If you're appointed as a kamikaze pilot and if the emperor comes to know that you are the firstborn son, then you are lucky because you would have the chance to continue your life to carry on the family name. That being said, most of the kamikaze pilots were not volunteers. They were given a paper with just three options, volunteer willingly, simply volunteer or don't volunteer, and these papers had the pilot's name on them. In other words, whatever you choose would be known to the others and choosing not to be a kamikaze pilot would put you in a perpetual and intense pressure from your peer and the community. The Japanese military policy back in the day was greatly influenced by the samurai spirit, which was death before surrender. These Japanese pilots were often taught to kill themselves rather than be captured, and they were trained how to die by suicide with their own rifles. They were also taught how to pull the trigger with their toe to a certain point under their chin so that the bullet would cause instant death. In an unlikely event where the soldier decided to try and escape instead, his fellow soldiers were instructed to shoot him from behind. Not only kamikaze pilots, but several other Japanese soldiers took this military policy really seriously. Even the Japanese civilians chose suicide over capture. One of the last acts of a kamikaze pilot was to write a letter to their parents. Japanese naval ensign Kiyoshi Ogawa is one pilot whose farewell letter survives to this day. Ogawa was the pilot of the second plane to hit the USS Bunker Hill, and his letter was all about describing his pride in working for the Emperor. He also wanted his parents to be proud of him for this noble mission and want his mother to take care of her health. He stated in the letter that he was happy to be a kamikaze pilot even though we are not sure whether he was actually that happy, considering he was clearly going to die. 
During World War II, the Japanese viewed Emperor Hirohito as a deity under the Shinto religion. Because of this, the kamikaze pilots were extremely loyal to the emperor. Most of these kamikaze pilots were very young boys. In fact, about a thousand of them were student soldiers who graduated from university early just to make them eligible to be drafted. When the Special Task Force was first formed in 1944, not a single officer trained at a military academy volunteered to join, so they clearly knew something was not right about being a kamikaze pilot. The Allied propaganda depicted the kamikaze as ruthless killing machines whose main focus was the destruction of the Allied forces. But the truth is, these kamikaze pilots knew nothing about their enemies, and they did not have any hatred toward their enemies according to their letters. This is because most of these kamikaze pilots had zero experience in actual combat, because of which they had no concept of an enemy in their mind. They were just bombarded with some philosophical ideas about patriotism and they didn't know what they were sacrificing their lives for. Before boarding their planes and embarking on their final mission, the pilots were forced to line up and have one last drink with each other and salute to their commander in a special ceremony. The planes for the suicide missions were stripped down to basics so that the Japanese could fit in as many explosives on the planes as possible. Most of these kamikaze pilots did not have a choice to come back because their planes only had enough gas for a one-way trip. Sarcastically, the famous Japanese reliability was clearly not with the planes. Most of their planes were really outdated that could go wrong any time, maybe even before the mission actually got accomplished. These aircraft tended to have engine failures and other mechanical problems. The pilots were instructed to divert and return back to Japan in the event of like this. After the plane got repaired, they would resume their suicide mission. The shortage of airplanes was also a problem towards the end of the war, which was why some kamikaze pilots were trained using gliders instead of a plane. When the war ended, those who luckily survived in the mission were too poor to make it back to Okinawa in Japan and, when they finally returned, so many of them were killed during the Battle of Okinawa, including the first sons who were exempted from being a part of the kamikaze mission. So, it is clear that the life of a kamikaze pilot was really difficult because their mission was literally a one-way ticket. The Japanese kamikaze pilots were unconditionally trained to defend their country at the expense of their life. It's hard to imagine the societal pressure if they refused to comply to become a pilot. It is even harder to imagine how the kamikaze pilot felt before boarding and crashing into the Allied warships. Wars are terrible and we should avoid it at all costs. After being defeated by the Allies in World War II, Japan was forced to sign a surrender agreement presented by General Douglas MacArthur in 1945 and was deprived of any military capability. Under Article 9 of the 1947 Constitution, Japan forever renounces war as an instrument for settling international disputes and declared that Japan will never again maintain land, sea or air forces or another war potential. It was then occupied by US forces between 1945 and 1952 and only had a minor domestic police force on which to rely for domestic security and crime. And that's a wrap for today's video. What video should we do next? Do let us know in the comments section below. Also, please support us by subscribing to our channel for more content just like this one. Thank you for watching Binge History. We hope you enjoyed the video. See you guys next time.